When we think about climate and how that's going to impact on bushfire risk, I think it's really helpful to go all the way back to the start of the conversation that has been happening in the science communities for about 150 years, which is how does the climate actually work? And so apologies for all of you who are already kind of on board with climate change, but I just think it's really important to get everyone on the same page as to what, how to, why we believe the science and why it's so important to start taking actions um, around that. So, in the ice cores that are collected by organisations like the Australian Antarctic Division and the University of Tasmania, we have carbon dioxide concentrations, little bubbles that are in the ice that tell us exactly what the atmosphere used to look like. Up, and up to 800,000 years ago. They're pushing back at the moment to try and get to a million years, but 800,000 years ago. And we can see that that wiggles around quite a bit. But look where we are now. We're in a completely different paradigm right now. But who cares? We care because of the relationship of carbon dioxide to temperature, this red line. That red line there is, a, is the temperature proxy that comes out of the, those same ice cores. Um, it, in this case, it's for Antarctic temperature, but it, it's an indication of global climate temperature. And the relationship between those two, the correlation is so strong that we're really worried about what's going to happen at this end of the spectrum here. And, cli and climate science has been trying to figure out how that relationship works for a really long time. Now we can see that we've shot up carbon dioxide concentrations and the observations are telling us that the global climate is warming too. Now I absolutely love these two figures, I, I nerd out on them. So this one here, every single one of these circles is a picture of the globe. And what this is showing is from the 1850s all the way through to 2019, Every single measurement of temperature that humans have made summarised into one figure over that entire period. We can see at the top that there's a lot of white, and that's because we, hadn't, we didn't have a lot of observations across the entire planet. Then it moves through a blue zone where it's colder than the baseline period. Then we move into the baseline period, which is the 1960s and 70s when we had satellite and we could see the entire planet. And then we move into the current period where we see it's going red. So although any one location is moving around a little bit in terms of whether it's red or blue or, or in the middle, we can see this gradual trend going from white through blue through a kind of grayer zone and then into red. So the, the planet is generally warming. So we've got one piece of evidence that is showing us what that looks like with carbon dioxide and, and, and temperature. Now, in this other one, imagine that you're on the planet Mars and you've got your telescope and you're looking at Earth. All of this spatial variability is summarised down into one number. It's just the, the global temperature, and that's what we're showing here. We've got in this spiral plot where it's, it's showing the monthly change and we're going from the kind of the, the historical baseline of 1900 to um, onwards and then we're moving out to the, to the current period. Um, as, it, as it warms up, it moves away from the center. And we can see that it wiggles around quite a lot. There's a particularly big jump that happens um, in the um, mid 80s, there it is, just jumped out there. And we can see that you know, there's, there's really warm years that happen all the way back then. That's just natural variability, that's fine. But what's happening is that the entire globe is moving away from that center point and moving towards this 1.5 degree line. And you can see 2016 and 2019 are two very warm years there. And they're kind of flags of what we're expecting to see by about 2050 every year. Now we have lots of other observations that are showing us it's warming. We've got ocean temperature, we've got the amount of ice on the planet, we've got um, global sea level. All of these things are all indicating the same thing. The planet is warming. So we've got carbon dioxide concentrations going up and we've got the planet warming, but who's causing what? The only way to understand that is to use a model. And this cartoon here 
is a great summary of how these models work. Every single word on this cartoon represents tens to hundreds of equations that sit inside a simulation that describe how the climate works. And each one of those equations represents tens to hundreds of scientists who have spent their entire career trying to figure out how those equations should be structured. So this cartoon here is summarising millions of hours of human effort, understanding how the climate system works and testing over and over again the different ways that we try and understand that. And when we take all of this, uh, these simulations, these, these equations, and we put them together, we end up with a climate model. And climate models kind of look like this. They're dynamic. They're moving. So we've got a high cloud and a low cloud layer, and then we've got a surface layer, and the surface layer is showing us temperature. We're watching it change at hourly time steps for the first two weeks of this particular model run. We can see how the clouds are interacting with the landform, and so the, the synoptic systems come across Tasmania, they get pushed up, the clouds form over the land, and we can see how that's all working. So inside these models, they do an amazing job of showing how the climate works, and there's no observations in them. They're just equations that were based on the observations. So they shouldn't really work, but they do, and they do an amazing job. And this is what we use to try and look into the future, because we can't make observations of the future, or well, not yet. And, um, and so there's lots and lots of variables inside these models. This one here, we're showing soil moisture, and what we can see is how at the moment, the soil moisture is all drying out, but then a big front comes through. It hits the northeast of the state there, and then all the soil moisture gets wet again. We can see that um, come through about now. And it all gets filled up with water, and so we can use these, this information to start testing how the landscape is drying out and the kind of risks of, from fire that we might be seeing when we, type, when we um, incorporate that with the other components. So once you've got a model, you can do things like switch off the sun and see what happens to the planet. You can do things like take all the volcanoes out and see exactly what influence the volcanoes have compared to everything else. You can also, and as, as it happens, that's where two volcanoes went off, and you can see the impact that that has inside the model, all the different types of modelling that we've got. Here I'm showing the black line is the observed um, cli uh, climate temperature, the, the difference from, from the um, baseline. The blue zone is showing the global climate system with the carbon dioxide concentrations that have been observed. And the green zone is showing what the climate would do if we didn't have the carbon dioxide increasing in time. This allows us to very clearly understand what the, what the contribution of carbon dioxide is to the climate system. That blue zone and the green zone actually represent thousands of model runs that test everything that we do to make sure that if we've made a little mistake, at least uh, we've kind of tested it against other alternatives. With that system, we can try and attribute how much the carbon dioxide concentrations are contributing to, to uh, the, the warming. And we can see that in the black line, that's the observed warming. So we've got a warming of the planet of you know, 0.5 to 0.6 when, the, when this was made. But the greenhouse gases that humans have put into the atmosphere, just those ones, have contributed more than that. Possibly even they've, warmed the, they've tried to warm the planet as much as 1.3. But humans have also done other stuff to the planet that's cooled it down, such as putting a lot of dust into the atmosphere and sulfates. That's reflected a lot of light back out into space. So it's cooled the planet down. So when we put the green and the yellow together, we end up with the orange. And it looks very, very similar to the amount of warming we've actually seen on the planet. So it's almost all us. 
When we look at the natural forcings in comparison, these, these zones, these two here, and this includes solar activity, it includes volcanic changes, it includes changes in tectonics or any, any of these other things that we understand, they've barely changed at all. All of the change is from humans influencing the planet. And the changes that we're already seeing are causing disasters. They're causing climate fires, as the mayor just mentioned. They're causing significant droughts all across the, the world. They're increasing the risk of cyclones and high intensity rainfall everywhere. They're impacting on all our coastal cities and they're impacting on our environment. When I go and talk to schools, we're in a school today, so it makes a lot of sense to bring that up. When I go and talk to schools and I ask the kids, who do you think climate change is going to impact? They often just come back to me and say, oh, it'll be our grandkids. And I say, no, it's you. When I went through primary school, they were telling me it would be my grandkids. And I have friends that have grandkids. And that's where we're at now. The impact, we have been waiting for this moment. And now is the time to start taking, taking that into account, taking action. And the business world is following suit. In 2000, this is changing tack a little bit, but it gives a bit of sense of the urgency that we're sitting in right now. When the global financial crisis happened in 2007, the Financial Stability Board, which is made up of like the Reserve Bank of Australia and all the finance and treasury ministers and all those kind of guys, they got together and they said, how can we make a more robust financial system? And they were there talking with all of the big super funds, the big insurers, the reinsurers, the big banks, the people that basically have all the money in the world and they invest it in everybody else. And they all agreed that there were some regulations they could put in place immediately, but the single biggest risk to everybody's wealth on the planet was climate change. And from 2007 onwards, they have been engaging federal governments around the world to try and implement policy to, to change people's behaviour. And we've, we're living through right now how effective policy change is at changing behaviour. Your chairs are in that position because of policy change. It is very easy and cheap to do, and it's incredibly effective. But these guys, the richest guys in the world, still failed. They weren't able to have that influence. So what they did instead is they came up with this horribly named document, Recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. When you want to invest in something, you need to see a financial disclosure. It basically says, a prospectus. It says, what are the risks to this company and how are you going to mitigate those risks? They have said, we want everyone to include climate-related risk in those documents. And this has had a profound influence on how the entire system responds to climate change now. This document says that the market, all of the big investors, the market believes the climate change is real and it's caused by humans burning fossil fuels. So now, what that basically means is that nobody's opinion matters anymore. It only ma it's all going to be an evidence-based um, approach moving forward. In response to that, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority came up with this statement. Company directors who fail to properly disclose foreseeable climate-related risks could be held personally liable. Now, why am I bringing this up? It's because it has a massive impact on insurance. Insurance, and insurance to bushfire risk, the premiums are going up because the insurance rates are going up. The insurance, they're paying out a lot. They're paying out a lot to Australia recently. And this is something to be acutely aware of as to it's a real risk. It's a global response that will impact people in Hobart just as much as it'll impact people everywhere else. So what are the climate-related components of this, of our little place in Hobart? So here are lots and lots of pictures of, of, Hobart, of Tasmania. And we can see we're going from the 2020s, so about now, here, 
and each one of those is a season across the row there. So we've got autumn at the top, spring, summer, winter. Well, in every season, in every decade, we're going to get warmer. Now, it might be a little bit hotter in some locations, but more or less, like the rate of warming might be slightly warmer in some locations or in some seasons, but more or less, we're just getting hotter across the board, everywhere. We can see the high elevation regions are getting slightly more heat. Rainfall. We can see that in autumn, we're actually drying out quite significantly across the state. And we're working with Hydro on this, Hydro Tasmania on this, to understand how that impacts us. But this doesn't have anywhere near the same kind of clear signal that you see from temperature. So what we have to do in order to understand how those relationships impact on a day-to-day -day basis is delve into the model and have a really good look. And this is what we can see when we look at an index called soil dryness. The soil dryness index shows us that the current, the historical conditions and the future conditions, and we're seeing some dramatic increases, and those dramatic increases happen to be in the southeast of the state, right where we are. And those increases are quite substantial. And they really, really start to take off from about now onwards. So we've got a drying landscape and a warming landscape. Now, that doesn't sound good for fire, and i tell you what, it really isn't. The forest fire danger index has a pattern that kind of looks like this. It's going to be twice the danger over twice the area, twice as often, pretty much for everywhere across the state. But, and those, the places that are most at risk of fire are going to be more at risk of fire. It's, it's an eightfold increase in risk. Um, and it's, it's hard to really kind of get across how hard everybody who understands this is working to try and inform the community about how important it is for us to all take this really seriously. TAS Fire are doing an enormous amount of work. I know it keeps Dave up at night. Parks and Wildlife are doing their stuff and Hobart City Council have responded to this incredibly well. I, 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 it's hard to give them enough praise in how rapidly they've actioned this particular risk. They've done an excellent job. Now, we, I can give you heaps and heaps of figures on how climate's going to change explicitly for southeastern Australia. But you can, if you really love figures, and above, apart from just like, you know, it's going to get hotter, um, we've got a wine atlas that you can download. It's about the wine industry, but it's got lots of useful information in there you might like to use for managing your own property.